So drafting the disclosure letter, to put this in context, the background to it, of course, is that the purchaser buying shares, buying assets, investing in a limited company is taking an enormous risk. However carefully he investigates, however thorough his due diligence, there's always the risk that there's something he didn't know about, something that untoward about the target, which is going to cause him problems. And he's going to protect himself against that by asking the seller for a schedule of warranties, a series of statements, which if they turn out not to be true, the buyer is going to be able to get some of his money back. We're moving farther up the misrepresentation line. Okay, let me close that poll there and go back and look at the, the history of this. And the history of this goes back to a, a case called Eurocopy PLC against uh, Teasdale. This was a case uh, back in the early 1980s and a case which became uh, uh, the, the celebrated case on warranties and disclosure. Uh, it was the case that was constantly being cited. It, it seemed at times in justification of absolutely anything to do with warranties and disclosure. Um, but fascinatingly, in fact, didn't actually uh, prove anything at all. Uh, the, the facts behind this were that Teasdale were a company, a small company in the Northwest, who uh, leased and hired office equipment and consumable supplies for that equipment. In those days, effectively, photocopiers would be their main line of business. The matter remains open, which means, of course, that it's back down to us and what we actually put into the contract. So the ideal wording from the purchaser's point of view is that the rights, the purchaser's rights are not affected by any actual or imputed or constructive knowledge that the purchaser may have. Never mind what he finds out, he's still going to be entitled to bring his claim for breach of warranty. From the vendor's point of view, you can use exactly the same words in effect. The rights are not affected save to the extent of any actual imputed or constructive knowledge. Uh, given those two extreme pieces of drafting, clearly there's going to be a lot of negotiation and compromise uh, around this. And I imagine, although I don't know from the, the parties involved, I imagine that's what had happened in the Infinite Land case, because it's the classic argument. Purchaser accepts he shouldn't be able to bring a claim simply on the basis that, uh, or in circumstances where he knows full well there's a breach of warranty. What purchaser will be concerned about is with files, boxes full of documents in front of him by way of a disclosure bundle, trying to put that together, trying to understand uh, and make sure that somebody is coordinating responses. Make sure that you're aware of all the facts that are in your possession so that you know what you know um, and what effect that might have on your future claims. That brings me to the end of what I needed to say. Uh, you'll also shortly receive a link to a recording of this seminar, which you'll be able to view for a month from today's date. Uh, and if you want to know any details of further CLT live online seminars, uh, there's the link there at clt.co.uk slash CLT online. Uh, and just in time, somebody has come in with a question. Uh, let's just have a look at that question. Um, if acting for the buyer, how important is it to delete the words except for contents in the execution part of the disclosure letter? Um, let me put that up on screen so that everyone can see it. Uh, if you're acting for the buyer, how important is it to delete the words except the contents in the execution part of the disclosure letter? But thank you for attending this online seminar. Um, and uh, please note the final slide there, uh, details of the feedback form and of the link to be able to retrieve uh, the copy of the recording of this seminar that you can view for the next month. Goodbye for now.